Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Rails, round, uh, Rails Online Roundtable Trustee Update 2021. My name is Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Member Engagement Manager. Um, we are uh, excited about this event. It's kind of a unique event for us. Uh, we don't often hold uh, events specifically for trustees, um, but uh, we are gonna start doing it a little bit more often and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, before we do, I just wanna talk a little bit uh, about our agenda. Whoops, going the wrong way. Uh, so here's our agenda for today. Uh, I'm gonna do some reminders and talk about the recording and then I'll do Rails resources for trustees, just a kind of reminder for all you out there. Um, then we're gonna do our two presentations. We have Alex Todd, from the Prospect Heights Public Library District, as well as Joe Filipek from the Aurora Public Library District. Uh, we'll do Q&A for them, and then uh, I'll do a conclusion and wrap up. Um, again, I'm gonna fly through this, so, uh, so just uh, hold on tight. Uh, our format today, uh, only the presenters have microphone uh, and video rights. So uh, the, the, the three of us, will you'll be able to see us and hear us. Um, everybody else, uh, please participate in the chat if you have comments, uh, you know, but you can put it there. Choose the all attendees and panelists uh, option so that everybody sees it. If you don't, only the panelists see it. Um, and if you have questions, we're asking you to use that Q&A box, um, and that is located on your toolbar. Um, that will just help us organize everything uh, when we get to the Q&A uh, section. Um, again, uh, we'll try to get to as many of those uh, questions as possible. Um, you know, I don't think that we're going to get to all of them. We did get some pre uh, some pre submitted questions. Thank you so much for those um, that put them into uh, that that survey that we sent out. Um, you can upvote questions. So if you have the same question as somebody else, you can actually upvote it and uh, and kind of bump it to the top of the list. Um, and then we'll make a list of all the unanswered questions and try to figure out how to um, address them in future events. Um, again, this is going to be recorded. Uh, you will all receive an email with a link to the video. That video will be available in about 24 to 48 hours on our YouTube page, and you don't need to log in to access it. One thing I want to mention for trustees is uh, L2 Library Learning. This is our website. Uh, any any public library trustee from uh, from Rails or actually from our sibling uh, system, Illinois Heartland, um, can have access to uh, to L2. And this is kind of the key to accessing other resources on the Rails website. Um, so I, I do want to mention this. You have to be affiliated with your public library. So that means um, you'll have to request an affiliation that will be approved by your uh, public library director. Um, this is, a, I really encourage you to do this, this is a great way to get connected to us um, and to find out more about what we have to offer, which I'm going to mention in a second. Um, Rails eNews, this is our uh, email newsletter that comes out uh, once a week. Uh, around 6,000 people sub uh, subscribe to this, so um, it's chock full of resources that you can use as a trustee, uh, links to continuing education, grants, um, all types of events. Uh, and we also have all-site events like the Illinois Library Association events um, and other things in there, so please do check that out. Okay, so I mentioned the other things that you can access from the Rails website. We have a trustee training page that if you have L2, if you have an L2 login account, you can use this. Uh, a couple things we have on there, uh, Trustee Academy is a series of online courses that trustees can take. Uh, that short takes for trustees videos are pr uh, produced by the United for Libraries, which is a division of the American Library Association. Some great topics on there, including uh, things like uh, succession planning, board meetings, strategic planning. Um, those, those are really wonderful. They're short. They're easy to watch um, and just kind of reminder about that. We also have some archive webinars that we've done in the past. Uh, you know, we hire our own presenters. Uh, we've got a lot on there, so do check that out. And then I'll mention future networking trustees in a second here. Um, okay, so we did send out a survey before this event to, uh, and about 30 of you responded. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the questions was, what would you like to see from us in the future in, in regards to trustee networking? And the three big answers that we saw were uh, board self-evaluation, self director evaluation, and strategic planning. Uh, and you, you were able to choose multiple options, so it seems like a lot of people wanted that, that type of thing. So uh, I do want to mention that, you know, if you're looking for that in the meantime, uh, those short takes for trustees, which I just mentioned, available from the Rails website, there are, there are there are videos on each of those topics. So if you want to uh, preview those topics, check them out. Um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully in the, in the future, we will have events uh, that are a little bit more inter interactive than this. Um, so I, again, I'm going to mention this. Uh, we're planning out some more events. We're hoping to do it as a meeting so you can actually talk to each other. We can do breakouts. Um, th this event's not going to be like that, but uh, in the future, if you want to, if you want to help me plan, if you want to help you like a discussion leader, I would really appreciate it. I put my contact information in there. Um, get in touch with me. I would love to hear from uh, from you wherever you are. 
Okay, I'm done talking, thankfully. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Alex Todd. Uh, Alex is the executive director at the Prospect Heights Public Library District. Uh, and he's gonna talk more specifically about uh, budgeting for boards and budgeting best practices during the pandemic. So Alex, I'm gonna stop sharing and you are welcome to share your screen. Okay, hello everybody. I'm gonna be sharing my screen here in three or four clicks. There we go. Okay, as Dan said, my name's Alex Todd. I'm the director of the Prospect Heights Public Library District, and I'm gonna to talk to you about budgeting in the time of COVID. I've been told it's the feel-good hit of the new decade, 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. So uh, thumbs up, like, subscribe, hit that reminder bell if you please. So, you know, libraries are more important than ever. That's a complete sentence in and of itself. I put in during COVID, I could have just as easily put in during a great recession or during post 9-11 or during a hurricane or tornado or forest fire or civil unrest because patrons look to their library to help sustain their lives during times of crisis because we're there, we're reliable and dependable and we're available for them and we're providing the services to the best that we can under the circumstances that we're facing. We also don't judge. We bring people in, uh, you know, the people bring us their resume, we'll look it over. Uh, we help them uh, apply for jobs online for the first time ever. We help them identify where they can go for social services that they never in their wildest dreams ever imagined that they would need to access but we're also fun. Nobody's traveling these days, but people know that libraries have video games and board games and jigsaw puzzles and books and magazines and movies and uh, TV series that they can stream and book clubs that are online now and story times that are online now and stuff for their kids as well. And all of that helps make being at home for 10 months with your family a little bit more bearable. We're also keeping our staff on our payrolls. We're letting them work from home and we're not furloughing them or laying them off or otherwise putting them in a situation where they have to join a social safety net that is already stressed to the maximum because they are working from home and being productive. And keeping them on our payroll means that when we do reopen fully, they're able to come back to work for us right away. We don't have to hire anybody fresh, um, new, and train them from the start. Uh, by paying them, we allow them to maybe stay in their homes. And they're paying using their paychecks to buy groceries in our communities and school supplies and take out Chinese. And all of that helps those businesses survive COVID as well. But this is not the year to give back. Uh, my library looked at whether or not we should abate our levy in May. Um, we, in, in October, we looked at whether or not we should have uh, lower our levy or whatnot. And we realized that we really couldn't either way. Um, every library needs to levy for the full amount that they're authorized every year. Uh, it's particularly those that are in tax cap or PTEL counties or, or under PTEL. Uh, because if you accept less, you never get that money back. You can't ask for more next year because you asked for less this year. But if you accept less, that means you're authorizing fewer library services when, at a time when library services are more in demand and more critical to your community than ever. You're deferring necessary maintenance, and that never gets cheaper. If you don't fix that leak in your roof now, you're going to have to fix it eventually. It's going to cost more. You're gonna have lower staff morale. People love working in libraries and they're work, willing to work at libraries for less money than they might be able to get elsewhere. But if you don't reward them with even COLA increases every year, eventually they're gonna to get to a point where they have to find a job that they like less, but pays more because that allows them to stay in their homes or just to maintain their, their, their current uh, level of, of living. And all of that leads to just disgruntled patrons. But more important, not more importantly, but just as importantly, uh, lower and flat levies 
are really practical. They don't have the intended impact that you would hope that they would have. Because if you look past the low, lower levy last November, it's not going to show up on tax bills until next fall. And that's because spring receipts are based upon the previous year's extension. So the bills that are about to go out in March, okay, are based on 2020's extension that was established last May. And that was based on the levy that was passed in November of 2019. I have a hour long program on all of that that I give to my board every year to help them fall asleep. But it, that's the way that it works as, as convoluted as it sounds. So uh, it's just not, it's, it's not gonna show up until well past uh, the action is taken. So like I said, we looked at this for my library and we were gonna do something significant. We'd like, hey, let's abate our levy by 10% or lower our levy for in November by 10%. And as a ballpark, that was about a $50 reduction for the average household in my district. And the people that I talked to, they're like, well, my tax bill's like $12,000. I don't know if that's the average, but that's the, the several people that I talked to, that was the ballpark that they were in. And they're like, $50 is not gonna matter I'm not even going to notice that. If, and if I do, it's a rounding error, 11,950 over 12,000. Um, and I'm not going to remember that this was a thing the next time the tax bills come out. So unless the school districts or the other folks who are much larger proportions of our property tax bills, um, you know, libraries taking the hit does us more harm than it does good to our community. So if you want to have a lasting impact, on your community that helps them in the pocketbook and is measurable, um, eliminate late funds because that will help the people who need it most. That will help the single parent with two kids who can't afford to pay the $15 to, get, to clear their uh, library fines to be able to come back into the library so the parent can find a better job using the computers and the kids can um, come go to the school instead of hanging out on the corner um, and, and be more productive. So how we've changed has how we spent has changed this year, obviously, but it's also changed in a way that we can that's kind of familiar. Because you know, I kind of planned my budget this year like I would if I was doing a major capital project, like a new roof or rebuilding a parking lot or HVAC system or something like that. Because you're having uh, you're having um, uh, costs that you don't recognize on your budget. Now it's like, oh, where is that? Oh, that's because of the project. Uh, your staff are adjusting how they work. They're working from home or they're working in a different area in the building because their workspaces are under construction or uh, maybe they have to walk further because there's no parking lot. They're wearing hard hats or face masks or hearing protection or they're using Zoom um, to communicate and, and do all of that. They're adapting the services that they do. You know, if your parking lot's under construction, you can't have story time at the library. So maybe you're coordinating with the park district to have to have space, or maybe you're having your book club in the park or things like that. Um, whatever you're doing, though, your patrons are going to be on board because they, they, they they'll tell you that you should fix that we that leak in your roof 15 years ago. Now you have to, I'm glad you're finally you're finally taking care of it. Or I'm glad you're fixing those potholes because uh, they came back, uh, you know, every six months there was that pothole was back. And I, you know, I know I, I lost a tire two years ago from hitting them. So they're on board. Uh, they love the flexibility that your folks are ex uh, exhibiting by making their services available. And they will endorse that because they love their library. You do need to check on how your expenses have gone up and down over the last year. You know, for example, you're buying fewer physical items, most likely books and magazines and newspapers. Um, you're probably paying less for programming because you're not bringing in, you know, the puppeteer or the uh, or the traveling zoo or, or whatnot. Um, maybe you're paying a little bit less for regular library cleaning. You don't need to shampoo your carpet twice a year like you do normally, or uh, do your window cleaning. Those are savings, but those monies are being spent more on increased uh, audiobooks or streaming services. Maybe you're um, 
you're, 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 you're paying for a Zoom account now. Um, you're doing maybe specialized uh, cleaning of you know, COVID specific cleaning. You're spraying your building um, with things like that. So that's more, you're buying more PPE uh, than you normally do. So those are the things that we kind of offset each other. And we found that it's not quite a wash, but it's very even so where we are spending more. We found that we are spending almost as much less in other areas. Now, if you're a municipal or a city library, you definitely need to check in with city hall, call the city manager or the mayor or the financial uh, director, whomever controls your city municipality's budget process and just ask, hey, are you changing anything this year because of COVID in your process? Maybe they're starting their process a month earlier so the board, so the city council can have more time to look things over. Or maybe they want additional information or different types of information uh, from the people who are, um, that they're, they're getting the, uh, that information from. And if that's the case, the sooner you know about it, the better, because the sooner then you can uh, start your process to give them what they need. So your priorities for budgeting in order of importance, your top priority when budgeting needs to be your staff. Your, when you talk to people in your community, they don't talk about, oh, I, I loved the furniture in the library or I love the, the shelving or the light fixtures that you have. No, they're going to talk to you about how they appreciate talking to Jeremy at the circulation desk for a couple of minutes while they're checking out, um, you know, to talk about the latest season of billions or, you know, some city gossip or what have you. They love, they'll tell you about how Miss Carol's uh, story time is a family fixture and how they bring all three of their kids over the past 12 years, they've been bringing their three kids to her story times and they just absolutely love her. Or how Sam's book club gives them uh, just a needed evening out of the house every month and how much they love it. Uh, and I bet dollars to donuts, you guys, more often than not, when you're asked to highlight what's best about your library, you know, it's, it's the staff. My st our staff is fantastic and these are all the things that they do. So they need to be your priority in your budget as well, because if you don't have happy staff, everything else kind of starts to deteriorate. Um, if, if if Jeremy needs to hasn't gotten a raise in five years, he's likely going to need to find a job that pays more to help support his family, right? And if that happens, it's hard to replace Jeremy or Miss Carol or Sam because people are just going to the, the turnover at the library is just going to increase, and you're. They're, you're not going to have those beloved people, those institutions anymore. And that's really going to help degrade your image over time. You're not going to be the vibrant, welcoming community center that people love to go to. It's going to be more transactional. Uh, it's going to be more gray. People are going to come in, do their thing, and then leave. But you know, no one gets rich working in libraries. Nobody expects to get rich working in libraries, but no one gets poorer either, will accept get getting poor either. So you need to budget annual COLA increases for your staff at an absolute minimum. And that's just to keep their head above water at their current living standard. If you're able to incorporate a one, two, three percent merit pool along with COLA, your staff's going to run through walls for you because they know that resources are tight. They live in your community too, or a similar community, and they know that tax dollars are tight. And by giving them that respect of a COLA and a merit increase, you're showing that you're, you value their work and you know that that's the most important thing for the library and you respect them. And again, they will run through walls for you if you do that. And that will help dramatically, uh, you know, if you do do a, a construction project, you know, they, 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 them running through walls does a great job during the demo phase. You also need to continue um, funding for continuing education for your staff. We're not paying for mileage right now. Nobody's traveling to meetings or conferences. We're not paying for flights or hotel rooms at ILA or ALA or, or PLA or whatnot, but you still need to pay for memberships in those organizations. 
including along with uh, Rotary and Lions and Kiwanis and whatnot. You need to encourage your library director and have your library director encourage their staff to join uh, library committees and organizations and even better be leaders, volunteer to be the president or the chair of those committees, because they're gonna come back with so many great ideas from those groups uh, that will benefit your library to a degree that you can't even calculate. It's amazing um, how motivated they are when they go to these meetings and come back with these ideas and they implement them. You also need to provide tools for your staff to for ongoing training in-house. You're paying for folks to work at home. Um, they need to be able to, to work from home. A lynda.com subscription will help Miss Carol learn how to make her, her story time a YouTube channel, okay? Or do it on Facebook. Um, people who are working from home can use lynda.com or other resources to improve their Excel skills, which again helps the library in the long run. So those are the things that, uh, that that's critical for staffing. Safety is another critical concern uh, for, for budgeting. It's constant, but it's always a moving target. We're talking about COVID right now. Two years ago, though, we were talking about active shooter drills, right? Uh, there is a uh, section in my emergency manual about what to do if someone phones in a bomb threat. And I remember sometime in the 80s or 90s, when bomb threats were the, the big concern that people had. But the key to safety is to always review what you've done and to make sure that people know that that review is, is, is taking place. So we all did a lot of, of work um, in March, April, May, June, when we didn't have as much information as we have now. And it's you need to take a step back and review those steps that were temporary. It's like, oh, we'll just have these rope lines up for 30 days and that'll keep people in line for six feet apart. If you have rope lines, are those rope lines still helpful? Um, if so, great. But if not, what's a longer term or what's a better solution? Do you even need those anymore? Um, and you need to let staff and the public know that these discussions are taking place because that's what they expect you to do and uh, it, it comforts them to know that everyone's looking out for their safety. Services are the next critical uh, part of our budget, obviously. And this is the thing that has changed probably the most since March. it has been a bunch of services that we just can't provide anymore uh, because of social distancing. But there's other services that we've transitioned. Um, we either do them on a smaller scale or maybe we move them online. There's new services that we have uh, initiated. Curbside pickup. A lot of libraries did not do curbside pickup until now. And now most everybody is. So this is a really great opportunity for folks to take a step back and go, what are we doing differently now in terms of service and administratively? Are you doing any different administrative steps that might uh, that might benefit the library if you carry them over when we get back to uh, a post pandemic environment. And again, curbside pickup is a great example of that. Uh, many libraries haven't, weren't doing that before this, but after the pandemic, I mean, I could see a parent with two kids in the back who just wants to pick up their DVD hold, um, you know, pull up, call, they run it out a minute and a half and they're done as opposed to finding parking, unshackling the kids from their car seats, wrangling them in, getting the DVD, explaining why the kids, they can't go play in the trains in the youth department, haul them out, kicking and screaming. One kid runs away because one kid always runs away. You wrangle that kid back up, haul them back out to the car. They're still bawling their eyes out, locking them back into their car seat. Car curbside pickup is a really good service for parents, regardless of the environment. Key thing you need to keep in mind though is 2020 is not gonna be normal. We're gonna approach normal. We're, we're starting that with the vaccines and all that, but don't rely on full capacity events this year. If it happens, that's, that's great and it's easy to ramp up things, but uh, I, I really don't think that that's going to happen. We're going to have these limitations like social distancing and masks for a, a period of time. And even before, even after those things become a requirement, 
they're going to persist on an individual basis where people are still going to be kind of gun shy going to crowded places for quite some time, if not forever. This might be an event that influences people for the rest of their lives. And so they're a little bit skittish. So we have to be prepared for that um, and plan accordingly. So that is my time. Before I turn it over to Joe, I want to thank everybody. And I'd also like to put in a quick plug here that uh, uh, in addition to being a director of the Prospect Heights Library, I am also the president of Diders and Todd Library Consulting. With my uh, partner, Jim Diders, we have over 20 years of director experience, and we specialize in doing executive searches for library boards as they look for their next director. And we also do consulting on various other topics. My expertise is budgets and levying. And um, we're happy to work with boards and their directors to review their financial process and set up uh, processes in place uh, to help them establish savings for capital projects. Because again, that leaky roof has to be fixed and you have to pay for it somehow. And also to provide um, Good projections, financial projections, so you can kind of get a sense of where the library is going to be financially 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, if you're interested in any of that, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at alex at diderstodd.com. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate that. Uh, so our next presenter, as Alex mentioned, uh, is uh, Joe Filipek, and you may be familiar uh, with his name. He's the Rails Director of Consulting and Continuing Education. He's also a trustee at the Aurora Public Library District. So uh, Joe, uh, Joe's going to talk to us here about onboarding for trustees. And uh, if you're not already doing onboarding for trustees, uh, he's going to mention why it is essential. So Joe, take it away. Thank you so much, Dan. It's great to be with you all. Give me one moment here while I get things set up. Dan, that look okay? Looks great, Joe. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you again. It's great to be with all of you. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm director of CE and consulting. So usually I'm the one that's just introducing speakers and then turning it over to them. But now the tables are turned and I'm gonna be talking to you all today about this topic of um, employee onboarding. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm trustee at Aurora Public Library District. Now, about six months ago, the word district would not have been in my title. Uh, Aurora, as some of you may know, converted to a district library this summer. Uh, what that means in terms of the board is that all of a sudden, all of our board positions are now elected positions. And so onboarding is very much on our minds as we look at a scenario where our entire board could actually consist of all new board members. Um, now it's looking like a few of us are going to remain, but nonetheless, we are looking at several new board members. And in fact, just, just a couple of days ago, talking to our director about the onboarding process. So while half the battle is just finding those people uh, to run for the board, and of course, recruitment, succession planning could be a whole nother uh, webinar topic. The other part, part that really deserves our attention and consideration is looking at our onboarding process for new, for new trustees. Now, hopefully the, the reasons why um, are fairly obvious, but I think that they are worth uh, re-examining. Uh, the reasons, hopefully, that employers consider employee onboarding to be important, I, I think is, is the same re reasons, really, we should consider trustee onboarding to be important. Um, we want to set up these individuals to be successful in their position. We want them to understand the organization that they're joining because they're the ones going to be out advocating and, and talking to members of our community about the library. Um, we want them to understand their role and perhaps what the role is not. And I might underline that one. That is, that is very crucial, especially in the beginning, to help trustees understand their role. Um, we want them to understand what is expected of them, just as we would with any kind of staff member. Uh, we want them to feel supported and understand that there are places and people that they can go to with, with questions and when they have concerns. And of course, we want them to have that uh, positive first impression. And as they say, you just get that one chance to chance to make that first impression and having a really good onboarding process is I think an opportunity to do that for your board members. Um, I will say sort of anecdotally that in my position at Rails and my colleagues at Rails with some regular, regularity, we will hear from libraries 
um, who are having challenges on their board. There might be board members who are um, overstepping, micromanaging, um, maybe they're violating Open Meetings Act. Um, and while there are many reasons for this perhaps, and, and certainly each board member bears some responsibility in that, I think we always need to step back and, and it's useful to ask the question of whether uh, the board, the trustee was ever given the understanding of what their, their role should be uh, from the outset and, and perhaps what not should be. Because as we know, in the absence of information, um, people are just gonna draw from previous experience to lead them to action. And that action may not be in line with what is appropriate or expected for a board member. So I think it's really critical that we think about this as new, new board members are brought in. So these next couple slides um, I borrowed or perhaps stole without any uh, regard or shame from my wonderful colleagues, Kate Hall and Kathy Parker, who authored the book. Uh, some of you may know the Public Library Director's Toolkit. Hi, Kate, you're probably out there. Um, as part of onboarding, I think it's, it's a good idea, first of all, to put some resources in people's hands, uh, whether that is a physical binder or something you put together digitally, or maybe it's a combination of the two. Um, remember that at, at the time that a new board member is presented with whatever information you're giving them, they're going to have very little context to make sense of all the things that libraries do and all this information. Um, so it'll be helpful to have something that they can access actually not just then, but over time for reference or for clarification. So I put, um, I put a number of examples of what some documents are that you could include in some kind of onboarding binder. Um, I don't think a lot of these need much explanation. Obviously that kind of core library information, mission statement, organizational chart, et cetera. Do they have contact information for the other board members for the director if there's someone that works in an administrative capacity at the library that they need to reach about scheduling things whatever do they have the information that they need for that uh the sort of relevant calendars which is you know beyond just board meetings which is obviously a good thing for them to know it's you know is there an annual event held every year at the library that trustees should be aware of then there's kind of like the budget uh information in that calendar and what might be relevant to share in terms of dates and, and time frames the next three or four on here in terms of previous board minutes uh financial information director reports um this is to kind of acclimate them to what they're going to be seeing uh, in those monthly board packets so that it doesn't just come all to them in a surprise and not being familiar with sort of what is being presented. Then of course, things like bylaws, relevant library policies, uh, your strategic plan, and any information about maybe the consortium you belong to, library system like Rails or Heartland, uh, and state information. Um, Illinois State Library and those other organizations like ILA that support libraries. I imagine that some of you may do this kind of binder and, and give your new trustees uh, this sort of information as part of the onboarding process. If there are some other things that you like to give them, I invite you to use the chat to, um, to share that with the group. But I think this is just kind of a good starting place. Now, while it's great to get a binder together and give people something to hold on to. It's also maybe not a good idea to just give them this information and wish them good luck and Godspeed and see you at the first board meeting. Um, again, they, they maybe don't have that context. So I think that doing an orientation session uh, is really ideal. Um, a chance over the course of, you know, maybe a couple hours that they, you can sit down with new and perhaps existing board members to have an orientation where maybe you're covering the content of the materials that you've shared with them, but then an opportunity to go over some other things. Um, and here again, I think that while in practice, the library director and staff are going to have a big role in any kind of onboarding or an, an orientation process because they have that information. Um, 
it'd be great if if your board members, particularly the board president, I think, could be involved on in, in some level with orientation. And and if anything, if nothing else, it's also can be serve as a good reminder for board members, even longtime board members, to go over these things with new board members. Um, Great opportunity, obviously, to do a library tour during, maybe right before, or right after an orientation. Obviously, as a board member, over the course of their term, they're going to be voting on things and taking action that relates to the facility. That's one of the most important things that we have, and um, understanding the layout of the library and everything that it contains, I think, is really important. Um, how the library fits into the Illinois library landscape. Again, um, your library may belong to a consortia. Understanding how ILA and the systems and the Illinois State Library and the grants that they offer, um, things like the per capita grant, how the library fits into all that. Because over the course of time, they're going to hear you, hear the director or other board members talk about these organizations and, and helping them understand where their library fits in. Obviously, Open Meetings Act, Freedom of Information Act, I mean, there's several laws that are important for trustees to understand, but these are, of course, two really important ones, and maybe Open Meetings Act, the one that's most important for them to understand. And while they're going to go through that wonderful training on the Attorney General's website, and while there's obviously good information there, it can be hard, again, as a, a library board member to kind of figure out what does that mean for me in my role the, as a board and specifically to a library. So having some conversation during orientation about the considerations, especially now with this pandemic and how things are a bit different given our ability uh, to do things virtually, I think is a super important thing to discuss and make sure that your new board members understand. And then as we, as I outlined during um, the construction of a kind of binder going really maybe reviewing the most relevant policies as a board member to understand, um, it's a great opportunity to have somebody talk about how the library is funded, what does that budget cycle look like, um, and any kind of, and, and even just walking through the financials that they might see in their board packet each month, giving them kind of a framework to help them understand when they're approving those expenditures each month, what does that actually mean? And what are those documents? How, how is it being laid out for them? Um, I mentioned technology communication. Some boards might give their um, board members iPads or some device for their board packets. Do those board members even know how to use them? Are they getting email addresses? Do they know how to access them? Sometimes there can be a little bit of a divide in terms of technology competencies and so forth. And we just wanna make sure that trustees understand what they need to know to access what they have to access and to get at the communications that they need to get to. And of course, a great opportunity to talk about what, their, what the expectations are as a board member. Um, and this is, I think, a, a great, place for perhaps a board president to go through these things. Things like attending all the regular and special meetings of the board to participate in discussions, to read the agenda and materials in advance, um, to stand by decisions of the board. Board members have power through their vote and understanding once a vote's been taken to be supportive of the library and their, their actions. Um, and of course, to know li the library and its missions, its goals and objectives, its services and programs, all of these things in terms of expectations as board members can be a great opportunity during an orientation session. Um, this chart can be found in a lot of different places. Um, one of them being like the Illinois uh, trustee manual, and this is actually just kind of a snapshot of it. But when I said previously, one of the most important things we need to do um, for new board members is to help them understand what their role is. I think that a big part of that is understanding the difference between what the board does and what the director does. Um, so this chart, which um, again, you can find a lot of different places. And in fact, the, the actual chart has a third column uh, for friends groups is just basically looking at these areas of responsibility, such as policy, planning, fiscal, advocacy, and sort of outlining what the responsibility of the director is and what the responsibility of the board is. 
And I know that as you read that, it isn't always often as, as sort of clear cut. And there are definitely areas where there might be overlap. And every library perhaps approaches some of these things just a little bit differently. But end of the day, there is a, a very clear distinction of what a library director should do and be responsible for and what a board should do and be responsible for. So having that conversation, again, from the very beginning, for, an for someone coming into the board that maybe just doesn't understand what those distinctions should be is really, really important. And I think that this chart is a good place to, to sort of start with that framework and understanding for new board members. Um, just a couple last sort of slides I wanna share with you before we before I turn it back to Dan and, and, and we open it up to your questions. Uh, a few other things I think I would consider when looking at an onboarding. Um, is talking to your trustees, talking to new uh, new board members, um, and understanding that we may have very little or no information about them as an incoming board member. So a conversation that includes why did they run for the board? Why? Um, what what hopes do they have for the library and for their own service on the board? What do they hope to achieve? Uh, what skills do they bring? that may be a value to the board or even relationships within the community they may possess. Um, the mo most important thing for any new board member, anybody you want in the board is obviously that they're invested, that the library is important to them and they wanna do what's best, but they also bring skills that can be really helpful for the library or again, relationships. And so from the outset, it's good to understand what those are. Uh, onboarding is a process, not an event. Now I, describe the orientation, obviously that would be an event. But here again, remember that just like when you start a new job, it's very overwhelming. We throw a lot at our new board members through any orientation or onboarding process, and they're not gonna have the context. And while you might ask if they have any questions about what you shared regarding the budget, in that moment, they might not have any, but three months, they might have a lot of questions. So the idea of maybe looking at onboarding as a process over, six months or even a year and revisiting um, certain things over time might be an even more effective strategy. Because remember, unless it's a appointment, trustees are gonna be serving likely for four years, six years, they might have multiple terms. So there's no need to sort of rush through this process. And I think really looking at it as a cycle um, over time might be a really good strategy for that. I've heard libraries say that they use a sort of mentoring process or, or a, a mechanism by which they pair new board members with existing board members um, so that they have somebody they know they can reach out to with questions um, or just to chat about a concern that they have. Obviously, if it's just a kind of one-on-one -on -one situation, I, we don't have to worry about a, any kind of Open Meetings Act considerations there. So I think that can be a good um, approach as well. And again, just I, I think it's great to have both staff and board members be involved with any kind of onboarding process. I think that's meaningful uh, for honestly for both the staff and those new board members. And I think it's helpful for the existing board members. And I think it's something that is generally something they enjoy and, and appreciate being involved with. And then finally, I'll just I'll just wrap up by saying, and Dan mentioned some of these resources at the outset, but uh, if you haven't explored the Illinois State Library on their trustees and public library administrators page of their website, you can find resources like this Illinois Public Library Trustee Manual, uh, like the trustee fact files. And even though some of these documents might be a little uh, outdated in terms of when they were published, all the core information is generally the same. I also would encourage you to look at the Illinois Library Association as a big um, resource for us in terms of, of advocacy. The Library Trustee Forum um, is a forum within ILA that supports trustees, does a lot of continuing education. Um, and Dan mentioned United for Libraries before. So um, I think with that, I know we wanna wrap up to give some time to questions. So Dan, thank you all for your uh, attention, hopefully. And I'll turn it back to you, Dan.
Hey, thanks so much, Joe. And, uh, and just a reminder to folks, uh, I'm going to put the slide back up, but uh, if you have a question for Joe or for Alex, um, you can put it in that Q&A uh, section in your toolbar. Um, we're going to try to take them as much as we can. We did have some ones that we wanted to get to right away uh, because uh, these were the ones that were submitted through the survey early. So thank you for doing that if you were able to do so. Um, Joe, the first one is for you. And it said, how, did, how, do, I, how do we diversify our board through recruitment? Yeah, thank, thank you, Dan, and thanks for that question. Um, you know, of course, libraries are very much, in, ter in terms of staffing in libraries, this is the same question that libraries are asking generally um, in terms of diversification of their staff. And, and for boards, no doubt this is a challenge. Uh, many libraries, I'm sure some of those on the call, like you are just struggling to find a living, breathing person to serve on your board that are willing to volunteer. So the idea of then also kind of adding another layer in to recruit a diverse, I know is, 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 um, is a challenge. I, I guess I would say a few things. Um, a board definitely should aim to have a board that is representative of the community that it serves in terms of demographics, so forth. I think the most critical step is intentionality. Um, if we're simply saying, I hope we can get more diverse candidates, and, and if we do, then we're going to really prioritize and, and try to make that happen. I, I don't think that's enough. I think that there has to be a conversation that the board has, the full board, uh, discussing about what we mean when we say we want to diversify our board because that that might mean a lot of different things to your board members it might mean race it might mean age it might mean just that we don't have seven board members who are all on the west side of town i mean there's so many things um obviously if you're municipal library versus district library there's a bit of a, a of a difference in that in a municipal setting, that's also a conversation you need to, to have with your mayor and, and the people that are being appointed to your board and making sure that they understand that that is a desire of the board. But I think it just in terms of strategy, when we talk about recruitment, I would say that um, there's a need to just broaden your networks that you use for recruitment. And so if you're looking for better representation with respect to age or ethnicity or, or any of those other um, components, you need to find where those people in your district or city live in, where they operate in, where is their, that space and the network they belong to and look there to recruit. And then that old axiom of what's in it for me. So when you're doing that recruitment, it isn't simply, hey, can you be part of this board? It's also helping them understand why that should be something that they want to do. And then I would just, I would say, I guess in, in my final thought is is just the idea that if if your board if if you feel like you don't have a diverse board, um, just as important as who that board is is what that board is doing, and the action that they are taking. And so the board should be looking at how they can incorporate EDI into the work that they do, into strategic planning, into policies, into collection development, into their partnerships. And it's a Kind of a long, great, a long game approach of creating a more equitable and um, inclusive library for your community. And over time, if you build a library that's inclusive and equitable, you will have the, an effect on your users and then hopefully finding more people that are willing to be part of your board. So um, last thing I'll say is that Rails and ILA are really interested in the stock of the topic of EDI for both of us really a kind of priority area. And we're hoping that we can find ways to support you with this, this kind of uh, work. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And, and uh, Alex, I got a question for you, but before I do that, I uh, just want to address a question that was in uh, the Q&A. This is a question I think we can maybe crowdsource uh, as attendees. Um, it says, can you offer, Bobby, can you offer a link to the trustee role page? If you all uh, out there, uh, directors, trustees, if you have a, a, a document that you can point to publicly um, uh, about the, tr the, the role that trustees play at your library, and you want to put a link into the chat, that would be a huge help to us. I know some of you have already started doing that. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, this is a place to share. Uh, libraries are great at sharing. So, um, okay, Alex, I have a question for you. This was uh, sub pre-submitted. Um, it's a long one, so bear with me. Uh, what is an acceptable level of reserve carryover from one year to the next? I fear we are carrying over too much each year. One option is to transfer more to our special reserve fund, but I'd like to ab advocate for just decreasing our levy. 
Uh, and then the uh, parentheses is we are village home rule library and not subject to tax caps, although we try to, to hear, adhere to PTEL as much as possible. Okay, thanks. Um, first, if I could touch on uh, diversity of the boards just real quick, because this was something that one of my trustees brought back from ILA trustee day several years ago that diversity has a lot of different definitions. If you're a library district and you're serving more than one town, you want to try and have representation from the different municipalities that you serve. Um, you can have diversity in income level of your trustees. And if you try and have someone who uh, maybe is a single mom um, struggling to get by, they're going to have a different perspective for your board than a retiree might. Um, and all the they're going to be difficult to have, but there's a wide range of diversity that we can bring into it. That makes it a little bit more difficult. If you want to try and match all of that, there's more things that you have to have, but it also, I think, gives us a little bit more, uh, it calms us down a little bit. It's like we, we might not be having, uh, you know, a traditional viewpoint of uh, diversity in terms of ethnicity or, or gender or age or, or all that. But if we're meeting other criteria, like Joe said, that really, best suits our community, then we're doing that. Um, for the reserves, uh, so on the top end, the general consensus is uh, the maximum you can have legally in your operating account or any of your accounts other than your special reserve fund is about two times your operating expenses. And there's a, a something called the Miller formula that helps calculate that. Uh, the courts have never said two times is what it is. Courts never say what it is. They just take the question that they are addressing and say yes or no. And so court cases have said 2.8, 2.5 are too high. 1.8, 1.7 are okay. So again, the, the acceptable wisdom is if you keep it at 1.994 or 2%, you're going to be okay as far as people um, appealing their taxes and saying you have too much money on hand. On the other end, how much is too little or what is the recommended? Any amount is obviously desirable. I would recommend um, about 18, 18 months, six, six months worth, uh, I would say at a minimum, because uh, we get our money twice a year in the fall and in the spring with the tax disbursements. And you want to have enough money to cover that gap in case something weird happens with the disbursements. Uh, it's been a while and this predates my time as a director, but Cook County used to be notorious of for not dispersing the, the, their taxes um, in the fall that we now get in August and September until October or November, um, you know, so you need to have money in the bank to cover those. Um, if you can have up to, if you can have a year's worth of operating expenses, I think that is, is good because it just gives, it makes you feel good to have it and not have to worry about it. Um, but it is worthwhile to establish what your goal is as a board and to determine um, to transfer anything that is not allocated or that exceeds that to your special reserve fund. Um, you probably gained from my talk. Um, I will never tell you to lower your levy. I, I think that is wrong to do that. I think you need to get, and even if you're not in a tax cap, or if you're in a home rule area, I think um, agreeing to abide by tax caps informally, that's a, that's a perfectly valid strategy to do. But I still think you need to um, incorporate what tax caps would have allowed you every year. 2.1%, 2.3% this year, 1.8% a couple of years ago. Um, because those incremental increases, they're acceptable. But if you go flat or go negative, two years down the road, as a home rule, you would be able to have a 5 or 6% increase if you want. But that's going to make people go, whoa, what's the library doing? But if you just continually incorporate small incremental increases year over year, um, that's gonna make it better. So don't lower your levy. 
if you have money that you're not spending, and this year it may be a perfect year for that because you're not spending as much on things. So you have money, quote unquote, left over, put it in your special reserve fund because um, you're going to need a new roof sometime. You're going to need a new HVAC system. You're going to need a new building at some point. That's what the special reserve fund is for. And the more money you have on hand in savings is uh, less money you're going to have to add borrow or ask the people for or things like that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Joe, I have another question for you, and this is an evergreen uh, question. Uh, how do we prevent some board members from micromanaging operations? Okay. Um, I didn't know that happened. Uh, <laughs> so I think there are, a lot, there are several reasons why this happens. Um, obviously, some people just have micromanaging sort of as, as a style or a personal trait. And that's just kind of their almost modus operandi. It's just kind of how they operate. Um, obviously, we, we know that there may be board members that come in with, with, that have some kind of personal agenda and maybe the micromanaging is sort of directed towards that personal agenda. But I think that there's also, maybe in most instances where you have a board member or board members that are just really eager to contribute and want to be involved as and, and be helpful in as many ways as they can. Um, and this really comes back to what I was saying, uh, what I was saying about orientation and, and, and onboarding of helping trustees understand what that role is. Because as we know, directors and their staff are the ones who are responsible for those day-to-day -day operations of the library. Now, when you say micromanaging, that of course can mean a hundred different things. Um, but I think that as we're onboarding our new trustees and talking to them about, about role, it's important they understand that concept of, of collective authority, which is really, um, you know, for not just library boards, but, but really all boards that, no one board member holds any sort of legal authority on their own, that the, the power they hold is, is through their vote. And, and it is the collective will of the board that action takes place, not the will of any single, single individual. Um, so here again, onboarding and understanding roles. Now I know in, in practice, of course, um, when you have a, a board member who's micromanaging and you perhaps suggest that they don't understand their role, um, I really haven't heard of someone saying, oh, I didn't understand that was not my role. I will stop now and just go to be able to, like, <laughs> I know in practice that really doesn't happen. So I would say a few things. I would say that um, this is where the role of the, the board president comes in, of course, unless the board president is the one micromanaging. I know that that may be the case sometimes, but I think that ultimately it's the board president um, and their res responsibility as president to have that conversation with a board member who's maybe uh, overextending or, 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 or overreaching. I think there may be an opportunity as well to sort of redirect that energy, if you will, that if you have a board member that is being super active and, and really trying to micromanage, maybe there is a more sort of appropriate board project, a subcommittee, something that they can use that energy towards that is in a way that isn't going to at all hinder um, you know, the library staff or obviously the library board. Um, and, and this is also why we continue to offer and encourage trustees to engage in continuing education for boards to have um, board retreats, to bring in consultants that can work with a board. Because it's one thing for the director or board president to communicate something to a board member. Obviously, it's appropriate and, and necessary. But to have somebody kind of from the outside to just sort of re-articulate role, I think it'd be a, a really good idea. Um, and I think someone even put in the chat, I was going to say, just in terms of making sure you have good pop sound policies and bylaws that really sort of reinforce, again, what roles and responsibilities are for trustees. Um, of course, if anyone has a one or two sentence solution that's perfect and that would immediately fix this issue, please put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. It 
Thank you, Joe. And I appreciate that. And we, we appreciate all the participation that you all have offered uh, in the chat. That's been really helpful. Um, and unfortunately, that, that is going to bring us to the end uh, of our hour. I wanted to make sure that, that we were able to get um, everyone in. And, and I know that you all have, have questions that, uh, that were submitted in, and might, we might not have gotten to. I apologize for that. Uh, we knew it was going to be tight. So uh, we'll, we'll do our best to try to arc of those and address those at a later, uh, at a later time, at a later event. Um, that would be our priority. Um, I really appreciate everyone for coming. I know that there was another event that was going on today in DC or something. I, I wasn't completely aware of what it was, uh, but, but we thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Joe, for your presentations. They've been great. Um, uh, I will, again, we're going to do more of these. We're going to try to do more events uh, in which we can get you to talk as trustees, uh, as, as uh, library staff, um, a little bit about roles and responsibilities um, about some of these topics, strategic planning, uh, board evaluation, things like that, um, to kind of hear what you're doing and share links. And um, we think that this will be a really fun way for you all to, uh, to grow and, and learn from each other. So um, thanks again for the time. Again, this will be recorded. Uh, we will have a recording up by the, uh, probably by the end of the day today, um, but, but, uh, but more likely uh, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you. Have a great day. Enjoy the inauguration. Uh, take care, everybody. So long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Forgot to mention my children's artwork is for sale. I should have put in a plug for that sooner. Oh, well. <laughs>